3.30, we can, we can get started. So I'll just say a few words about the uh, seminar series. Uh, so this is our, actually you are our first speaker for the semester, uh, Dr. Lee, for the uh, uh, distinguished uh, seminar series in mechanical engineering. And this also is, uh, it, it, it is tied in with our uh, graduate student seminar series also. So you'll find a lot of uh, graduate students from the department uh, attending uh, this too. Uh, so we will be, I'll just uh, advertise a little bit. So we have got one more uh, seminar coming up on March 18th and uh, two more in April. So st uh, stay tuned. I'll, I'll put it up on Canvas for all all our uh, graduate students. And, and with that, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Lee for agreeing to do this. And I am definitely looking forward to, to the presentation. And I'll let uh, Dr. Zhang uh, introduce uh, Dr. Lee. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, welcome to our distinguished uh, speaker, Professor Judy from MIT. Um, professor Lee is a chaired professor at MIT. Uh, before he joined MIT, he's, uh, he's a, a, a professor at uh, Ohio State University, then the University of uh, Pennsylvania. So he, um, professor, uh, professor Lee has been, received many awards, including the 2005 Presidential Early Career Award for the Scientist and Engineer. And uh, uh, Professor Lee also uh, is a fellow for, uh, in several so society, including the American uh, Physical Society and the Material Research Society. And uh, Professor Lee is a co-founder of one of the MIT Energy Initiative, Blue Carbon Energy Center, and the Center for Materials in Energy and uh, Extreme Elements. And Professor Lee is also the chief, uh, the chief organizer of uh, MIT A, A plus B Applied Energy Symposium. And uh, that's uh, the, uh, the organization that is aimed to develop a solution to a global climate change challenge with A is action before 2040 and B uh, beyond 2040 technology. So welcome to um, Professor Lee again. Uh, it's, uh, it, uh, okay, thank you uh, everybody and uh, let's see our uh, uh, seminar, okay. Thank you so much, Jinsu, and uh, thank you, Professor Tafti for uh, giving me this honor. Uh, it's a great pleasure to talk about uh, some work that uh, has been uh, uh, going on in my group on trying to control radiation with high uh, spatial resolution uh, and not only sort of understand the, the damage uh, of radiation on materials and try to mitigate damage, but sometimes also using radiation to engineer structures and, 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 and properties. So I'll start by uh, showing something that we can get uh, in a transmission electron microscope. So we're looking at uh, the electron energy loss spectroscopy of uh, a 2D material graphene, but with uh, a phosphorus atom here as a dopant. Uh, so what, what we do is we're sending, uh, we're actually scanning uh, uh, 200 uh, or 300 electron volt uh, electron beam across the 2D material and looking at how much electron energy loss uh, is occurring at a given uh, spot. So, uh, there, there is this uh, uh, initial code called FEF9. So when we look at the computed uh, electron energy loss with the measured, we always see a, a, a quite a big difference. Uh, so when we do the calculation, initially we're assuming this phosphorus atom is a stationary. So it's a bit out of the, out of the plane. But then uh, after collecting a lot of these uh, spectra, we eventually uh, found that in order to fit the spectra, we have to assume this uh, phosphorus atom is actually uh, moving. So under this uh, very focused electron beam, uh, this phosphorus atom is actually bobbing up and down between two energy minima, and that can explain uh, this kind of uh, spectrum difference. And then uh, the energy that's involved 
just for that atom is, is actually quite high. It's uh, uh, on the order of, uh, if you convert to temperature, uh, it can be uh, several thousand Kelvin. So uh, all the nearby atoms are pretty cold, but you just have this one atom that's sort of uh, oscillating up and down and actually going through the saddle point. So uh, my student, uh, Su Tsung, so now he graduated, he's a staff scientist at uh, Berkeley, uh, Lawrence Berkeley lab. So uh, when he was a graduate student, he uh, did a internship at uh, Neon uh, Microscope. So this is a company in California that specializes in making low energy uh, TEM. So they're able to uh, have very good uh, aberration correction and is able to achieve, uh, for example, for this uh, 60 kilo electron volt electron beam, a very good spot size uh, that typically is used to uh, for atomic scale observations. So here uh, we have uh, a, a monolayer graphene with uh, four uh, dopant atoms uh, here. And then there are some uh, other dirt uh, uh, nearby. Uh, so when, when Tsong is imaging this uh, at Oak Ridge and at Neon, he sometimes see uh, images which are uh, abruptly changed. So it's sort of almost like a, a mode, um, something that's uh, sort of suddenly cut in half. So when he was scanning, for example, a carbon atom, sometimes uh, he actually see that uh, this phosphorus atom can actually uh, suddenly swap over here and you get half a phosphorus atom image here. So what has happened is when he's uh, parking the electron beam on this carbon atom, uh, it could actually give this carbon atom uh, sufficient energy uh, in, in radiation damage, this is called the displacement threshold energy uh, of about 10 uh, to 15 uh, electron volt. And that actually can flip uh, this single bond. So you have a 180 degree uh, carbon phosphorus bond rotation, and then, and then uh, it just happens. So this is called a direct exchange. And uh, we not only uh, can do it for phosphorus, but we can also do it for silicon dopant. And very interestingly, this never happens when we aim the electron beam at phosphorus, uh, because when you do the calculation, it turns out that, you know, even though the electron energy is 60 keV, 60,000 electron volt, but because it's such a light mass uh, object, uh, it doesn't give much uh, energy to a heavy mass atoms. So you only give more energy when the atom is, is carbon. And sometimes we also see a, a 90 degree rotation. Actually, this is a very famous uh, transformation in, in graphene where you, uh, you rotate this uh, bond by 90 degrees and you create uh, uh, two heptagons and, and two pentagons out of four originally near hexagons. So that's called a stone whales uh, defect, a stone wells uh, transformation. And actually depending on the angle uh, of the uh, sample with respect to the beam, uh, we can either get clockwise or counterclockwise 90 degree rotation. And this is also can be done for nitrogen atoms. So these uh, processes are, are really uh, interesting. And we, we like them because we think, yeah, it's like, uh, uh, you know, we're dribbling soccer ball. So maybe we can just move this atom, let's say to the center and, and make a triangle or make some kind of a device. So that's what, you know, we, we really like to see, but there are also risks. So one example is uh, that most often this, uh, this phosphorus is uh, threefold coordinated with nearby carbon, but occasionally uh, we actually knock out a carbon and then this uh, phosphorus uh, become fourfold coordinated. And then uh, no matter how we uh, rotate the sample, uh, change the angle of the electron beam, uh, we can no longer move uh, this, uh, this phosphorus dopant. Uh, so in that case, we have to find another uh, uh, soccer bore uh, nearby and restart the process. Uh, and then sometimes uh, we actually see uh, this phosphorus is replaced by carbon. This is not actually because uh, we knocked out the phosphorus from the calculation, it's, it's, not impos it's not possible. 
we think what happens is because there is always uh, add atom diffusion. So there's always carbon add atoms that sort of on top of the graphene. Uh, we cannot see it because it actually move very fast. It's like, like a ghost. But occasionally we can knock that add atom carbon uh, to sit in the phosphorus position and then that phosphorus become, a, become an add atom. And, and that also move very rapidly so it's not knocked into the vacuum, but just become add atom and join some reservoir nearby. So then we again lost uh, our uh, soccer. So we have to dribble the ball, find another soccer ball again. So these are the four uh, events that we see uh, in the scanning uh, transmission electron microscope. So we start to do some uh, models of uh, this process. So uh, we can, uh, by solving the relativistic, so even at 60 keV, the electron is still moving at about 45% of the speed of light. So we have to use uh, relativistic uh, kinematics to solve for the collision between the electron and the carbon atom. And that can only happen when the electron is within uh, 10 femtometer or 10 to the minus 14 meter away from the nucleus of the carbon. Uh, but when you get that close, it can actually give uh, uh, quite a big uh, energy, kinetic energy to the carbon atom. So uh, 16 electron volt or 17 electron volt. And then there is also this uh, scattering cross section where, you know, there is an angle theta and phi, you know, where you can sample the direction of the, uh, of, of this, what we call primary knock-on momentum. Uh, and depending on the angle, you can either have uh, direct exchange, uh, the 90 degree rotation or knockout uh, from the simulations. So here are some uh, numbers. Uh, so we say that uh, this uh, 60 keV electron, 45% uh, of speed of light, it has to get within uh, uh, 10 to the minus four angstrom from the carbon nucleus to give it a 10 EV uh, electron energy. So the cross section uh, to give this kind of energy is just on the order of a barn. A barn is, uh, is a nuclear quantity. So it's, uh, it's basically this uh, squared. And that energy transfer happens uh, 10 to the minus 22. Uh, so zeptosecond uh, time scale uh, is going to give the energy to the nucleus. But that's not, uh, what happens uh, in, in, in most of the cases. So we have a beam current of uh, 50 picoampere. So we actually have uh, one electron penetrating this graphene layer uh, every three nanoseconds. So uh, in one second, we actually have, uh, yeah, we, we actually have uh, uh, hundreds of millions of electrons that are penetrated. But only uh, one out of 100 million can get within uh, this one barn of, of an area. So even when we focus the electron beam to an angstrom squared, but one barn out of angstrom squared is still one out of 100 uh, million. And so uh, we only get one direct hit every 10 seconds. So that, that hand that you see is, is, is have that kind of uh, hit rate. Uh, so uh, the rest uh, will be, uh, you know, it, it's going to just zip through uh, this one angstrom uh, area from the nucleus, uh, and it's going to cause electronic excitation. Uh, so that's actually going to drive uh, the electronic subsystem into excited state, and that later uh, relaxes, but it's going to heat up the ion, and it actually can give the ion temperature uh, to very high. And so that uh, electronic excitation happens at the attosecond time scale. If you divide the thickness of graphene with uh, the speed of electron. And then uh, there is also uh, this electronic relaxation, which we assume for graphene is, is rapid. So it's a femtosecond. So you have a, like a very nice separation time scale. The collision is 10 to the minus 22. The excitation is an attosecond, and then the electronic excitation is, is, is a femtosecond. And then that uh, carbon phosphorus bond switching 
happens at a picosecond time scale. So this is the atomic motion uh, time scale. And so assuming this very nice separation of time scales, uh, we can say that you know, we can use uh, this uh, Born-Oppenheimer approximation to describe the ion dynamics. And so we can actually uh, just use uh, the DFT simulations to track the trajectory, track the momentum evolution of that uh, primary knock-on atom, and then look at the branching probabilities uh, into uh, these different outcomes, where this I runs from one to four, uh, are those four outcomes uh, that I've shown before, and then this gamma stands for uh, the vector momentum. And then the tilde stands for uh, the momentum before the collision. So after uh, without tilde is after the collision. So we can use this double differential cross-section to describe the carbon atom's uh, momentum distribution as a function of its previous momentum uh, uh, before the collision, the electron momentum. And then once we have this, we can look at the success rate. So this is coming from a uh, TDFT or ground state DFT calculation of the of, of this collision event. So uh, we're plotting the outcome by uh, this color. So blue here stands for a 180 degree uh, bond rotation and the magenta stands for 90 degree rotation. So if we have 16 electron volt uh, energy uh, on the carbon, we get these two outcomes as, uh, as, as, a, as a function of the uh, direction of the, uh, the, the, the momentum. But if it's a lower energy, then uh, no 180 degree rotation. And if it's a uh, 70 electron volt, then we get uh, also a knockoffs here. So you see that it's quite sensitive to the energy to within one electron volt. And one assumption uh, in this plot is we assume the carbon have no uh, initial uh, thermal momentum, also no quantum uh, velocity. Uh, but that turned out to be actually uh, not a good approximation. So uh, in fact, uh, a, a big part of the work is actually trying to understand uh, why uh, the following sort of come, come out of the calculation, which is that if you assume there is a carbon nucleus that's completely stationary, and you send uh, this electron to within 10 femtometer of the nucleus, then uh, say we get a, an energy of, of 10 electron volt on this uh, carbon 12 uh, nucleus. But for the same sort of a, a distance, if uh, in the calculation, this carbon is moving uh, with 0.1 EV velocity, like a seven, several thousand Kelvin uh, temperature, then actually the outcome can be 12 electron volt. So there is a very strong sensitivity on the initial velocity of the target. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, you know, you make a two electron volt difference, you just have initially energy difference of 0.1 electron volt. So eventually we rationalize this, uh, it's just a frame translation effect. So uh, imagine if we co-move with the velocity of this nucleus. So we co-move with, with this atom. And then uh, this electron, because it's moving so rapidly, uh, essentially in the co-moving frame, uh, this electron velocity uh, doesn't change. It's still 40% of speed of light. But when you do the energy uh, difference, uh, you're going to get uh, this term. This term is the 0.1 electron volt. Uh, but now you're going to get this linear term. And because this linear term, you get 10 EV uh, before. So actually this uh, coupling term from this Doppler uh, frame translation effect overwhelms uh, the initial uh, uh, energy by, uh, by a lot. So that explains uh, this uh, very sensitive uh, dependence of the final moment of the final energy on the initial uh, velocity. So you see that uh, as as the vibration energy of the carbon atom changes, uh, the the outgoing velocity have a huge energy difference, and that can affect uh, it's a direct exchange or knockout mechanism. So uh, this actually uh, uh, sort of. Uh, uh, get our uh, uh, thinking going that, you know, you could actually 
uses uh, instead of uh, damaging the material uses to manipulate uh, individual defect in atoms and have perfect uh, atomic control on atoms. So uh, in this kind of uh, uh, effort, uh, you always try to balance the throughput uh, with, with risk. So when I say throughput, uh, in, the, in the 80s uh, from IBM, uh, people can al already use uh, uh, atomic force uh, or, or, or scanning tunneling microscope uh, tip to manipulate, uh, in this case, the 48 atoms to form this uh, quantum corral structure. But uh, AFM is uh, have moving parts, so you are limited uh, by the mechanical uh, control. Uh, whereas with an electron beam, uh, you, you, you're using magnetic lens, so everything is electronic control. And so the idea is you may be able to move uh, atoms much more rapidly than, than the previous uh, mechanical uh, tip. But then uh, you see that, uh, you know, if you increase, uh, let's say the intensity or, uh, you know, you, you, you define certain operating uh, modality, then uh, you could also fall into this trap state. So there, there needs to be a balance uh, between the, the throughput of atomic uh, manipulation with the electron beam. And in the future, you know, electron beam is very uh, uh, multiplexable, right? You can have electron beam that do the imaging, you can have electron beam that do the writing, and you can have many, many electron beam operating on the same uh, material because it is so localized. So sort of the aim is to get very rapid manipulation uh, with multiple beams, but sort of try to avoid uh, this kind of trap force. And another uh, very interesting application is, you know, in our model, there is actually always an error because we assume, you know, everything uh, is uh, electronic uh, ground state, but that may not be true uh, on other uh, platforms like boron nitride, uh, where you have long-lived uh, defects. So this could also be a way to uh, learn the, the error of, of, of uh, quantum uh, simulations. So uh, Tsung uh, is, is developing uh, basically uh, scripts to let the uh, electron microscope to play with the atoms overnight. So he find that, you know, uh, instead of using hand, to uh, manipulate atom is actually much more rapid to use computer vision and uh, the computer to sort of learn from this kind of games and, and uh, learn, uh, improve the, the predictive capabilities. So the eventual goal of this kind of thing is to use uh, radiation to uh, precisely control one to a thousand atoms where uh, we precisely know where uh, where they sit, uh, their position, but in the future we can also change uh, their uh, valence state and their nuclear spin state. So these are actually smaller uh, than the nanotechnology, uh, even though we're using a lot of the, the tools from nanotechnology, but it's sort of more uh, engineering uh, uh, oriented than <laughs> the atomic optical physics. And the goal is, is really to, uh, you know, impose human will onto uh, individual atoms uh, for, for uh, device applications. So uh, that was uh, using uh, electron beam. So uh, next I'm going to talk about neutron damage and an ion beam. So this is an accelerator at, uh, at MIT uh, that accelerated uh, ions. And uh, in fact, uh, this field is uh, still has a lot of uh, un unfinished uh, business uh, from first principles. So even the definition of uh, DPA, which is a, a displacement per atom, it's it's a, it's a unit of of radiation damage or exposure, is still uh, still problematic. Uh, there is this very well known code called the SRIM, and then uh, this report says that you should only use a particular version of SRIM and you can only use this particular quick version to give the correct uh, DPA uh, result. So uh, we have uh, developed a simulation codes, uh, which is uh, an open source code that uh, can do 
uh, basically stream calculations, but can also handle three-dimensional geometries. So we have two ways of representing geometry. One is kind of a vector representation. The other is a finite element mesh uh, representation. Because traditionally, a stream can only do a thin films or multi-layer. So systems with just basically one-dimensional uh, uh, geometry. Uh, so we are able to, uh, this IM3D code is able to reproduce uh, for example, argon ion uh, implanting into a silicon, uh, we're able to re uh, 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 reproduce the doping profile. Uh, the, the smooth line is our code and the, the, the symbol is from Thrim. Uh, and also uh, both the, the full cascade version and the quick uh, Kinching piece version, uh, there's a factor of two difference uh, and we can reproduce both of them. Uh, and this is uh, parallelized, so we can run uh, uh, 10,000 times faster. So something that traditionally takes an overnight run now just takes uh, minutes uh, in, in a parallel computer. So to illustrate you know, what this can be useful for, uh, one is to use a very well collimated, just like electron beam, uh, you can focus uh, the nano beam ion beam and use it to uh, sculpture uh, materials. And, and this is very different uh, from a broad beam exposure. In a broad beam exposure, you have this thing called a Bragg peak, where the peak damage uh, is not on the surface. But if you use a pencil beam, actually uh, as shown here, uh, the peak damage is, is right on the surface. So therefore by tuning uh, the width of the beam and by rastering the surface, uh, you can control essentially some kind of a 3D printing of, of the damage. So well, we have used the uh, M3D code to look at, for example, you know, people uh, have been uh, trying to make these uh, nanopillars to do mechanical compression experiments, and people use uh, uh, ion, accel uh, ion, um, ion accelerator to generate you know, some DPA in the material, and then later fib out uh, the material to do the to do the small scale uh, sample test, but what uh, uh, my my student uh, uh, ex student Yang Yang shown is that uh, if you, you've you've got actually you know after this exposure got to actually cut out uh, the the first four hundred nanometers of the tip uh, from the surface because you actually have a lot of ion leakage from the from the surface, so your DPA is not uh, what the stream uh, tells you. Uh, so you, you got to actually cut uh, uh, quite quite uh, this initial uh, head off, and and also we can use this code to study, for example, if you have a a burning plasma in a fusion reactor, then what is the ion retention on a, on a rough surface? So what you see here is a, a, a tungsten surface, and under bombardment by helium. Uh, uh, because to relieve the residual stress, it actually grows this, uh, uh, this, this, this tungsten uh, uh, nanofilaments. And, and this actually affects the so-called ion uh, albedo effect. That is uh, how much uh, ion is retained versus how much ion is, is uh, sputtered out of, the, out of the surface, which is going to pollute the plasma. So we can actually handle this kind of very complex uh, nanostructure and, and compute the interaction of ion radiation with uh, these uh, nanostructures. We can also design, for example, uh, a one ion beam, uh, it could be a nitrogen beam with another beam which creates vacancies to, for example, create a nitrogen vacancy uh, centers. So these are used for quantum computing in diamond. So we can try to model, we have two, uh, well, when you have one broad beam and maybe one nano beam, you know how what kind of what kind of certainty you can have in in creating this kind of uh, nitrogen vacancy centers, uh, and you can actually use uh, this uh, ion beam uh, to uh, create a strain uh, in in materials as well. So this is actually a very interesting collaboration uh, with uh, Professor Berggren at uh, MIT where. We showed that by this uh, very uh, focused helium ion beam, uh, we can inject the bubble near the surface. And that's actually going to blow form. It's almost like a blow forming a glass. And then uh, you can actually impart uh, a few percent tensile strain 
uh, in 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 this in, in this region. And so, of course, the trick is, you know, how can you create a string in these uh, bubbles or this kind of uh, shaped bubbles uh, without creating damage uh, in 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 the region uh, themselves. So, so this is still. Uh, an ongoing research. So the, it illustrates uh, what a nano beam uh, radiation can, can do. And also uh, there are artifacts. So when you try to uh, mimic neutron damage uh, with an ion beam, uh, there is this well-known so-called injected interstitial effect. So, so the basic idea is that uh, certainly you can use ion beam to mimic neutron beam, but in most situations with neutron, uh, neutron uh, is isotropic in momentum. So you actually get uh, this uh, primary knock-on atom in all different kinds of directions. And so you're going to create a vacancy here and some interstitial elsewhere, but it's going to be balanced by, you know, uh, interstitials that's going to be here. So overall, you don't have a net so-called polarization uh, of the vacancy versus interstitial. Uh, but if you have a, 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 uh, an ion accelerator where the momentum is a delta function, uh, then there's a problem because you're always going to have in certain regions, uh, um, you know, more vacancies and some certain regions with more interstitials. So this is similar to, you know, in any kind of radiation response. Uh, you know, if you have a material under, let's say, light radiation, we know there is always a, a polar response. Uh, so indeed, this is also true for ion radiation. There is this uh, polarization effect uh, where you have a net polarization where the interstitial and the, the hole is. So what we propose is uh, actually to rotate a sample uh, with a, a, a well-chosen angle, like a magic angle spinning of the sample. And that can actually cause uh, within certain depths uh, a, a well balance of the vacancy with interstitial, so you don't get uh, excess uh, uh, polarization. So, so this was a, a proposal that we recently put forth to sort of uh, remove uh, this polarization artifact when you try to use ion radiation to mimic a neutron radiation. So uh, with this kind of models, uh, we can also use it to direct mechanical property uh, studies. So a lot of my group's effort is on trying to come up with uh, structural materials which are robust against radiation. And we actually found some pretty surprising uh, effects. So this is uh, uh, in collaboration uh, with Professor Wei Zhonghan. Uh, so he did work at uh, Los Alamos where he injected helium into uh, single crystal copper. So uh, you see that uh, where uh, this uh, peak uh, helium uh, uh, deposition, uh, you actually get this very big uh, bubble uh, 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 porosity uh, in the single crystal copper. And, and each bubble is uh, just a few nanometer in size and, and very highly pressurized. Uh, what is surprising is when we deform uh, this single crystal, it appears very ductile. So generally, you know, helium, uh, it embrittles the material, the macroscopic material. What is surprising is uh, actually when we inject helium, uh, it actually makes the systems uh, appear to be more uh, ductile, uh, even more than without, uh, even more so than without the, uh, the helium bubble. So without the helium bubble, there is this so-called size effect uh, in the uh, tensile stress strain response. Uh, this is because when you have a dislocation, you generally have an avalanche that move from one surface to the other, so you get a huge strain burst. But when we uh, inject the bubbles, there is hardening, but we don't see a big, uh, this kind of flow serration, and it's actually pretty ductile. So this actually taught us that indeed the helium embrittlement is very closely related to grain boundaries. Uh, when helium goes to grain boundaries, it sort of creates a two-dimensional crack, and that's not only you know, very bad from a linear elastic fracture mechanics point of view, where, you know, the highest stress concentration is, is not a sphere, is not a needle, but it's, an, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a two-dimensional, like a penny-shaped crack. But also all the grain boundaries are connected. So you have a natural percolating cracking system. If you don't have the cracks, 
uh, helium is actually not bad for this uh, small scale, uh, you know, like an order of micron size structure. So this is another proof. So we made a we made a notch, and when we deform it, uh, you can see that you have these uh, partial dislocations and stacking faults. And and if when we don't have these, they would just move very 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 far. But with the helium, uh, they actually get stopped at the helium bubbles. Uh, so they don't go uh, very much. So these are almost like a precipitates that uh, kind of uh, stops the, the dislocation avalanche. And this also have an effect on uh, this uh, uh, shape memory or, or super elasticity effect. So when we take, uh, for example, this uh, nickel iron gallium uh, system, so this is a well-known super elastic material. So it means that uh, when you uh, compress it, but when you unload it, completely go back. Uh, so even though there is energy dissipation, but there is no plastic strain when you unload. But there is a size effect. When we go from two microns to about one micron, uh, the pseudo the super elasticity is completely gone. It becomes plastic. So uh, no more uh, phase transformation induced uh, super elasticity. What we found, however, is that when we uh, implant the helium bubbles, uh, we actually get back some of our recovery. So this is quite interesting because this would allow us to sort of pattern the mechanical behavior uh, of a small structure by implanting helium. You can think of it as like a 3D printing of, of the helium bubbles. And the reason is because we think these bubbles, uh, as we demonstrated before, uh, they stop uh, uh, dislocation slip, they stop stacking force, but they cannot stop uh, this bigger, uh, let's say, uh, B2 to B19 prime uh, phase transformations. So relatively speaking, these bubbles uh, enhance the uh, plasticity flow stress, uh, but it, it doesn't uh, enhance the uh, uh, phase transformation uh, stress uh, as much. Okay, so in the last part of, of my talk, I'm going to uh, talk about you know, using uh, this uh, understanding that we got from uh, ion beam studies uh, and, and modeling and trying to come up with uh, uh, macro scale uh, engineering materials. So for example, at MIT, we're developing this uh, high magnetic field uh, talk mag. So, uh, uh, the idea is to use uh, uh, high temperature superconductors, uh, so this uh, disco material, to uh, create a very high uh, magnetic field. Uh, and this allows you to shrink the size of, of the reactor. And actually the cost basically scales with uh, the magnetic field to some high power like three. So uh, this uh, would greatly uh, accelerate the development of, of an engineering prototype to really get energy out of the, the burning plasma, uh, which is confined in this donut shape thing here. But there is a, a big problem, which is, you know, when you take this high field approach, you have naturally a smaller heat transfer area. So you're gonna to have to have a vacuum vessel material, which is gonna allow high energy neutrons to, to penetrate. But on the other side, you're gonna have a molten salt, uh, things like, uh, uh, fly and, 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 and Flimax. So Professor Jinsu uh, is, is, is expert in corrosion. So we're actually collaborating on, 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 on some of these uh, work. So the, so the trick is to come up with a, a, a material that can sustain uh, you know, up to a thousand Kelvin uh, in temperature and it does not corrode uh, with the molten salt and also can sustain uh, helium uh, because a very big problem uh, in nuclear structures is it, it needs to be creep resistant. You need to uh, uh, also corrosion uh, uh, resistant. It needs to uh, be load bearing, but uh, it also needs to be radiation resistant. And furthermore, radiation can give uh, transmutation and uh, you're gonna have these helium bubbles in these macro materials and, and actually the helium uh, really limit uh, the life of the vacuum vessel to something that's not economic. So the, the, the really the trick is to think about how to manage uh, helium. So in my group, uh, Dr. Kampio So, uh, 
he, uh, when he was a, a PhD student in Korea, he has uh, developed a method to disperse uh, carbon nanotubes uh, into metals. And, and many people have worked on this, but he has uh, a special recipe that allows a very uniform uh, dispersion. And uh, when he's able to make uh, micro-sized uh, samples. So this actually is, is very interesting because uh, in this ancient Damascus saber, so this is actually, uh, the steel come from India, but later uh, due to the Mongolian invasion, which cut the trade route, uh, now nobody know how to make that uh, Indian steel anymore. But what people have done is when they put it under the TEM, they found actually, um, you know, microscopically there are actually these uh, cementite nanowires. That's, that's not very surprising, but they're actually in carbon nanotubes also uh, in, the, in, in this ancient steel. So here you actually see a multi wall carbon nanotube. Uh, the layer spacing here is, is matching that of the, the graphene spacing. And also, uh, uh, this has a huge amount of uh, uh, carbon in it. Actually, this is uh, up to two weight percent uh, carbon. So this, this you would say is you know, it's cast iron. This is not steel, but yet uh, this is both very strong and, and very ductile. So what uh, Kang Piu have done is he, he was able to uh, disperse this in aluminum uh, up to two volume percent of carbon nanotube. And this is the tensile stress strain curve. So two volume percent is about one weight percent carbon nanotube. And with the current price for a multi wall carbon nanotube, this would only kind of double the cost of your aluminum. So this is uh, economically okay. Uh, but it gives you uh, up to 50% uh, improvement in uh, tensile yield stress without uh, sacrificing the, the ultimate uh, ductility. So, uh, and this has been scaled up, so you can make a lot of it. Uh, and, and the trick is uh, wetting. So uh, carbon nanotube actually doesn't wet uh, metals very well. So if you just put it inside, it just floats on top and it don't get good dispersion. But uh, by using different ways, we're able to change the wetting angle between the carbon nanotube and, and the molten aluminum. So this red is the molten aluminum. This is an impeller. And at some point we're going to put in something called the master alloy. So this is, pre-mixed uh, ball milled uh, carbon nanotube with some aluminum in it. And then uh, just accelerate. So initially, you know, you, you see this, but, but eventually you're able to disperse uh, these one dimensional uh, tubes uh, into the molten aluminum. Now uh, a drawback, a drawback of, of this is uh, actually uh, it's not very stable against water. So <laughs> I just say uh, at the beginning, but it does show a very good uh, radiation uh, resistance. So uh, uh, let's see. Uh, so what we did here is uh, we implanted helium uh, into pure aluminum and then uh, with 0.5 weight percent carbon nanotube. And so uh, without the carbon nanotube, we see these big cavities uh, then basically no cavities in here. And then even up to uh, 72 uh, DPA, uh, there is just very little uh, cavitation uh, inside. And when we uh, do the uh, hardness measurement, so this is a mechanical measurement, we see that uh, when we uh, have the control aluminum, uh, you know, at, well, without the radiation, our aluminum is, uh, is a bit stronger with carbon nanotube, but with radiation, it, it, it very strongly hardens. This is actually not a good thing. Uh, within just a few DPA, it, it reaches a peak hardness because of radiation defects. And then it sort of uh, seems to soften. Now this softening is not because the radiation defects are gone, it's because it starts to swell and sort of turn into this Swiss cheese uh, morphology. Uh, but with the carbon nanotubes, uh, we harden we have also hardened, but doesn't harden as much. And we reach peak at around 20 DPA, which is like seven times more than without carbon nanotube. And then we also soften, but we don't soften as much. And when we open up the structure, you know, it doesn't seem to have 
as much cavitation as the uh, control. So not only microstructure wise, but sort of mechanical property wise, uh, you know, having uh, this kind of 0.5% uh, 1D dispersion uh, definitely improves radiation resistance. Now there is a lot of radiation mixing uh, when you do uh, 72 dPa. So that basically means every carbon and every aluminum atom is knocked out uh, from their original site 72 times. Uh, and so without much radiation, actually uh, the carbon nanotube is chemically gone, but it's kind of like a fossil record. So, you know, it's a rock, no longer organic, uh, but the morphology uh, maintains. <clears throat> so we see this very long straight uh, aluminum four carbide uh, in the post radiated material. And it, it still sort of maintains this kind of interfaces. And this is important because generally we know that nanostructures, uh, you know, their interfaces provide venues for uh, radiation vacancies and interstitials to recombine. Uh, but the, the, the question has always been how robust are the nanostructure themselves? Do they, you know, globulize? Do they, you know, try to reduce surface energy and turn into a sphere and, and no longer become a nanostructure? So uh, we've shown that actually uh, these carbon nanostructures can uh, still maintain uh, a large uh, interfacial area, even up to hundreds of dPa. Another uh, very interesting thing is that uh, these materials hardens not only the, the room temperature uh, tensile strength, but also the high temperature creep strength, which is what we need for nuclear materials. So creep basically means, you know, let's say at 70% of the room temperature yield strength. So it doesn't yield right away, but you wait a long time with that load on as a dead load and you have patience. So what we found is that uh, unlike traditional precipitate hardening where you have you know, particles that stops uh, dislocation, for particles, the dislocation you know, can just, uh, if you have patience, just can wait for vacancies and climb over uh, these uh, precipitates, uh, you know, if you have time and temperature and patience, so they would creep over them. But with micron lens uh, carbon nanotubes, uh, the dislocation can climb over it. Uh, and you actually have to use a brute force or on looping to be able to uh, move a glisso dislocation across uh, a carbon nanotube. And it also doesn't, doesn't react Unlike a forest dislocation, it doesn't react uh, with a with a glacial dislocation, uh, and also this actually refine the grain because this uh, unlike the particles which pin the grain boundaries by the Zener pinning theory, uh, the one D particles with the same volume fraction actually pin the grain boundary uh, more more effectively as well. So with with all these effects, uh, we we show that for example with a fifty percent uh, data load. Uh, with a control aluminum, uh, you know, you, you would uh, you would have a creep rupture at uh, 320 Celsius, but we can improve the creep temperature by 70 Celsius, uh, and that's a big deal because aluminum is actually a very good material. It's corrosion resistant. Uh, it's, uh, it's it's light, but people know you know it's just very soft uh, at about 200 C also. So improving by 70 Celsius. Uh, in creep strength is, is actually pretty pretty big deal. So like I said, uh, we actually give a name for this uh, hardening. So when, when we compute how, what's the total length of carbon nanotubes, uh, when you have a well, when you have a good dispersion at one uh, volume percent, it's actually on the order of 10 to the 14 per meter square, which is similar to the forest dislocation density uh, in a medium may work hardened material. So this is a trick. So it's actually in terms of hardening, it's like a forest hardening, which we know is, is a good hardening mechanism, it doesn't embrittle the material uh, as much as let's say a uh, hot patch relation. Uh, and, and that's why we think it maintains uh, the ductility. So what we show here is uh, previously, there are different ways of making uh, carbon nanotube uh, uh, nanocomposites with high energy bore milling, 
uh, in situ carbon nanotube growth, uh, slurry mixing, low energy bore milling. But in, in our approach, we're able to strengthen the material in yield strength uh, by 40% but without sacrificing the ductility, where most of the other approaches, they would embrittle the material. So what we show here is, is toughness. And this is not only true for pure aluminum, we actually have used uh, these actually pretty high alloy, uh, 6,000 series uh, aluminum alloys, and it still have a very potent uh, strengthening effect, uh, as well as uh, it actually improving the toughness, the tensile toughness of the composite. So uh, we've also done uh, uh, this in situ uh, TEM uh, observations uh, in collaboration with uh, Memeli at Argonne National Lab, where uh, this is the ion beam uh, that's coming at the sample and this is the electron observation column. And so uh, we can clearly see uh, carbon nanotubes, multiple carbon nanotubes, where the spacing is uh, 3.3 uh, angstrom. And this is, uh, the key thing is this is not on the grain boundary. This is actually in the interior of a grain. So we have this uh, intragranular dispersion. And then with the krypton ion radiation, uh, we're gonna form these, these bubbles and you can see the radiation defects. Actually the resolution is not so good, but uh, we see actually the, uh, this kind of uh, radiation defects gets uh, absorb into uh, into the carbon nanotube. And uh, Kangpil have done uh, quite a bit of statistics. So it turns out that for uh, radiation damage, uh, what, what matters is not the average radiation uh, defect size. Uh, what matters is the extreme value statistics. So what's the biggest defect cluster that you can find? And, and in this sense, uh, having these one dimensional nano dispersion limits sort of the biggest defect size. And we think that's the, the key reason for, uh, 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 for, for the improved uh, uh, radiation tolerance. So like I said, the previous material forms this aluminum carbide, which is not very radiation resistant. So, uh, but we have now uh, found other nanowires uh, like titanium oxide nanowires and we have dispersed it in, in nickel alloys. We have made uh, uh, samples like this, and we have recently uh, put them into uh, the, uh, the Heifer reactor at Oak Ridge, and uh, we have uh, developed uh, all these samples. Actually, we just have received these samples uh, fully irradiated to a few DPA. So we're actually now analyzing uh, different uh, 1D nano dispersion uh, nanocomposite uh, behavior uh, post the neutron radiation. So uh, with that, I'd like to uh, finish. So I think uh, uh, the goal is, well, the, the, the whole sort of uh, uh, talk is, is, is sort of trying to connect from something which is very microscopic uh, at a nano scale or even atomic scale and understanding and modeling damage at those resolutions but then from uh, this kind of characterization and modeling, uh, we can uh, eventually, uh, through uh, processing, get uh, bulk scale uh, nanocomposite materials that's uh, radiation resistant, but also uh, temperature and corrosion resistant. And uh, hopefully, you know, with, with more collaboration with Professor Jin So Zhang, we can get uh, more headways into the molten salt problem. Uh, and also, there is also a nice sort of uh, flip side to this word radiation damage, which is that uh, if we can control them uh, well enough, so it's no longer just a scalar uh, displacement, threat, a displacement threshold energy, but also actually have this uh, angle dependent uh, uh, PKS uh, 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 surface, then we can actually use it to uh, control defects and control nanostructures like that uh, low forming of, of, of diamond. Uh, and also we can even use it to control individual atoms uh, for uh, defect engineering for quantum information processing. So uh, that's, uh, uh, that's the talk. I'd like to have uh, answer any questions. Thank you. Oh, 
Thank you. Thank you, Brother Lee, for the good talk. So we have about 10 minutes for question. Uh, if you have a question, please, uh, you can input on the, in, the, in the chat or, you know, you can raise your hand, but I don't know who how can get with your hand. You can you put your name in the chat so I can, yeah, ask you to give the question. Any questions? So if no one is, I will ask a question. Yeah, I, I'll, I think it's easier to speak up because it would take a lot of yeah. writing in, in the chat. Um, mm -hmm. um, so Dr. Lee, very uh, interesting talk. I am not a, um, you know, a, a deep radiation materials type of person, but uh, the, the question I'm asking is more philosophical in the sense that uh, you you showed us, uh, you started out at the atomic scale and you ended at the macro scale, right? Yes. Now, now many times, uh, so I, I do understand that you can do a lot of things at the atomic scale, right? With the different techniques and, and at, at, at those scales, at those time scales, at those lens scales and so on. Um, and you can learn a lot, right? The, the, the question I have is, um, how do you, or, or in, in, your, in your experience, how do you take that? And you did show some examples, but what is, what is the progression of that from that atomic scale to uh, the macro scale uh, in, in terms of, you know, the feasibility, the economics of that and, and so on. I, it's, it's sort of a vague, big question. If you would care to say a little bit about that. Uh, um. Yes, yes, that's a great question. Thank you. So uh, indeed, that's the problem that, you know, I've, I've been thinking for a long time. And uh, today, uh, that connection is very, uh, vague and haphazard, but we do have a few sort of uh, success examples. So one, for example, uh, sometimes you get surprises at, at the nanoscale. So, uh, you know, this, this experiment showed that, you know, sort of almost like uh, uh, proof by exclusion that the grain boundary is very important. So uh, actually the helium tolerance uh, to uh, largely come from the grain boundary. And if you can eliminate ground grain boundaries, then uh, you have a chance to uh, reduce the sensitivity of, 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 of this helium vulnerability. So then you have two ways to do that. One is that if you can uh, make a single crystal. So in fact, uh, people in the turbine industry have made single crystal turbine blades for nickel alloys uh, just to reduce the creep. And we can actually do that. And in fact, recently we've shown uh, you can use the uh, 3D printing using an electron beam to uh, repair uh, a, a single crystal turbine blade surface. And so we're now actually working on uh, printing single crystals. Another way is uh, if you can't do that, then you got to have a lot of traps of, of helium. So computationally, we're working on you know what kind of uh, nano structure, what kind of interface can give you uh, can give you zero D or one dimensional traps. So those traps, even if the helium completely bound those surface, do not give you uh, a stress amplification factor of infinity. So from elasticity, we know that you know if you have a if you have a if you have a cavity which is a which is a, a cylindrical cavity, then you just get a, a stress amplification factor of three. Uh, but you don't get infinity. So this is the idea uh, behind this 1D uh, nano dispersion is we think uh, 1D is the best because if you have the 0D uh, nano dispersion like particles, then you don't get as good a creep resistance. But if you go to 2D, uh, they definitely will stop dislocations 
but you also get this easy crack path. So we think this 1D would be the best for trapping helium and give a strengthening without embrittling the system. So uh, indeed, uh, uh, Professor Tafti, you, you're right on the pause, which is uh, this connection today is not uh, rigorous. So it's, it's always sort of, you have to have a person and uh, have to talk over it. But I think, you know, with uh, uh, rapid prototyping with high throughput experiments, uh, you know, we can actually now tune the processing of let's say heat treatment and, and, and different kinds of wetting treatment. So recently we have a paper on, for example, material selection, what kind of uh, oxide or carbide or nitride filler wets uh, molten metal. So we can actually use that to come up with design criteria to come up with uh, maybe uh, candidates to give better nanocomposites. So I think combined um, machine learning with some mechanistic insights is, is the way uh, to go uh, at this point. Very good, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we may still have time to ask one question. So does anybody has any question? Um, I, I do have a question. Mm, please. Um, so yeah, Professor Lee, uh, so you, you guys were putting, I guess, carbon nanotubes into aluminum uh, and it was increasing its uh, the temperature, its maximum temperature and the radiation hardening. Um, is there, did you find like that material is mechanically stable? So say I could drill holes in that material? Yes. And with that? Yes. Okay, yes. So you could. Yes. Okay. And so uh, most, most of these uh, composites, they only show compressive strengths, but uh, our material, this is a tensile stress strain curve. So it's, it's a oh, dark okay. material, yeah. Okay, great. So, so you could drill coolant passages and things like that in it and yes, wouldn't absolutely. affect it. Okay, yeah. cool, great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, other questions? Yeah, uh, I have one question. Mm, please. Yeah. Uh, hi, Dr. Uh, Lee. Uh, very nice talk. Um, so uh, I have one question, may not so related to the talk today, but generally I'm wondering that uh, if you did uh, anything uh, related to the radiation study of metal organic frameworks, because for that yes, materials, yes, yes. Yeah, for that materials, uh, I see there are a lot, a lot of radiation study in metals or alloys, but are less radiation study in soft materials. Also, since I'm a computational guy, uh, I didn't see much more uh, computational study about that part. Is there any limitation, or if your group actually did some uh, simulation study on morph? And what will be that limitation and what's your thought on the radiation study in MOF? That, that's a great question, thank you. So yeah, if you go to this uh, website, uh, uh, we, we have recently uh, uh, two uh, papers, uh, uh, one in Nature Communications on using MOF to absorb uh, xenon and krypton, which is uh, radiation fuel uh, off gas. And uh, there uh, we mainly did uh, gamma radiation and beta radiation. So those were uh, experimental results. And there's a big variation. So some of uh, are very radiation stable, uh, at least in gamma and beta, where some are not. And we haven't actually done any simulation in that. So I think that'd be really, really interesting. And in terms of ion radiation uh, resistance, I think uh, I haven't seen much work and we certainly can do that kind of experiment. And I think that'd be very interesting as well. So MOF is, is, is tremendously, uh, uh, interesting new system and, and it's been proposed uh, as a gas separation and gas storage medium. So we are using it to, to treat uh, xenon and, and krypton uh, isotopes. Yeah, because I, I think for that paper is focused on the absorption part and uh, for more phase radiation, mostly it's experimental result. So I'm just- yeah, no, no simulations, we, we haven't yeah. done any. So uh, if you have some, uh, uh, interest, uh, yeah, yeah, that 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 actually be very very interesting because we could do the experiment uh, on that. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, we actually have samples, so you know we have 
you know, if, if your models, uh, you know, uh, do on, on any uh, standard morph like H cursed or these uh, morphs, we can synthesize them and we can do custom uh, radiation. Okay, thank you very much. Is there uh, other discussion want to propose out? Any other question? No question. Okay, so uh, thanks for um, speaking again. So, um, Professor uh, Tavti, so can I continue to use this uh, Zoom after the seminar? Because I want to show uh, my lab to Professor Lee. Actually, I have I have the I have your link. I can I can use that. Yeah, okay, we can use other. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay, thanks everyone. I really appreciate thanks. it. Yeah. So let, let me let me just thank uh, Professor Lee for uh, for the seminar and for uh, willing to uh, you know do it and and uh, I hope uh, all our graduate students uh, learned a lot. And I'll, I'll see you back on the 18th again, where we have a speaker from uh, University of Houston. So thank you all for attending. And again, thank you, Professor Lee. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank sure. you. Bye.